Okay, so in this video, I'm going to talk about Google Colab and go through Google Colab for beginners. So I know a lot of you who watch the channel understand Google Colab, understand how it came about and stuff like that. This video is really more for people who've asked questions and comments about how do we run the code? What exactly is it? That kind of thing. I'm almost going to talk a little bit about the history of Google Colab, some interesting little tidbits about it as we go through here. First off, I want to point out something really interesting is that if you look at the URL, you'll see that the URL for this is colab.research.google.com. And that's because Colab actually came out of Google research. So to this day, they've kept URL that was the sort of internal URL used when Google Colab wasn't actually a public service in there. So Colab basically started off internally at Google, I think around 2011, 2012, it got made public around 2017 from memory. And really when it became public, it really changed a lot of things. It really made it accessible for a lot of people to be able to do things like machine learning and stuff like that. So back in the early days when we were trying to teach people TensorFlow and stuff like that, it used to be an absolute nightmare to get beginners to be able to set up their own environment on the machine or something like that, or build something in the cloud for them to use. Colab really changed this game. This is where I think a lot of us owe a big debt of gratitude to Google for stepping up and doing this. This is not something that's really a moneymaker for Google. It's something that they did to basically help people and help the community learn machine learning and learn to be able to do this stuff. So what actually is Colab? So Colab is basically a Jupyter Notebook service. It's like Google's own version of Jupyter Notebooks that runs in the cloud and you get given your own VM to run it. So it's basically tied to your Google account, your Gmail accounts. You can use it totally for free. I will go through the sort of free stuff. And then there's also a paid version if you do want to use the paid version to access better GPUs, that kind of thing. In If you come into this particular site, this is actually colab.google, which was made much more recently than and colab has been out. It actually takes you through a bunch of the different things that they've added. And since the early days, they've added a lot of things to this. There are a lot of things that you can use to basically make your learning for machine learning, for coding much easier. What I'm going to do is walk through a sort of little Colab crash course, talk about the different parts of Colab, show you a bunch of things in here. And then in a more advanced video, we'll look at some of the advanced features that you can use Colab for as well in here. Okay, first off, you'll see that when you basically open a Colab, these are basically what we call notebooks, right? So when you open the notebook, if you've used Jupyter Notebooks before, you this stuff will just become you know really obvious to you. Because like I said, this is basically Google's version of uh, Jupyter Notebooks, just where they've added some extra stuff in here as well. But if you haven't used that, a notebook is basically where we can run code and we can also run cells that have markdown in. If you look at this kind of cell here, when I double click on it, I'm basically getting a cell that I can look at the text in here. And this is actually marked down in here. I can put in bullet points. I can put in images. I can put in a bunch of things in here. And when I basically close the cell, you'll see the text out here as well. And you can see in this example that here, not only have we got marked down for headings and stuff like that, we can basically bold text. We can do italics on text. We can do a bunch of things like that. So it makes it a nice way to basically run code and to basically run code and to be able to write notes about the various things in here. All right. So the two kinds of cells are going to be a text cell or a code cell. And you'll see like at the bottom of each of these, we can add, I can add in another text cell if I wanted to do that in here. If I come over here, I can basically delete a cell. I can close it. If I'm doing that, I can open it. If I'm doing it, if I want to get a link to a specific cell, I can do this. If I want to move a cell up or down, I can do that there. And if I want to delete the cell, I can just delete it like this. All right. Now, if we come into uh, the code part, you'll see here, generally, most people are going to use this for writing uh, Python code. Colab can actually support R as well, although I don't know why you would want to use R nowadays personally, but you're going to see probably 99% of all the different Colab notebooks being Python. Now you can see here, we basically got a number 
for the line number. So if I come down here, you'll see line two, line three, line four, etc. going on. But then in the actual cell, so this is a code cell. Here I'm setting a variable to be 25. Very simple kind of thing. Now I can run this by pressing the play button. And you'll see something like this where it says, you know, that, okay, this is a notebook that was written by me and you can select run anyway in this case. And for this particular one, you probably don't really want to save it or anything. But if you do want to save your own one, you would come up here and do save a copy in drive. And what that will actually do is save a copy of my notebook that I've shared with you to your Google Drive, and you can basically use it in there. All right, now you see that as we've gone through and run this cell, now if I come through and I actually run the next cell by pressing play, you can see now that if I click down here, we can see that this got run first and this was run second. We can see in the standard out here, we've basically got the output of this variable, right? Because there's nothing else in here. So just running this, we've got the standard out. Okay, so there are multiple ways that you can run these. We can actually click the play icon. We can also click command enter or control enter. And what that will basically do is run the cell in place, meaning that you'll notice if I come in here and I run that, you'll see that it's run it and my cursor is still in there. As opposed to, clear the output again, as opposed to if I do shift enter, it will run it and then it will move to the next cell which is the one that you most, you know, that certainly I use most commonly when I'm working with this. You can also do alt enter to run a cell and automatically insert an empty cell below that. If you're on the last cell and you do shift enter, it will do that by default. Okay. So next up, it's important to understand that we've basically, what we're doing here is we're creating a runtime. So it's like setting up our Python environment in this VM. And you'll see when we've connected to this, we've got this. So you'll see up here, I've basically got an environment where I've got Python 3 running. I've got a VM with this much RAM, and then I've got a, a GPU, and then I've got this much disk space to use. Now, this runtime is, I can change the runtime type. So you'll see that here we can have the Python 3 or R. Like I said, we're probably not going to use R, but we could just have a standard CPU machine. I'm not going to do that, change that now. Or I can select a TPU machine in here. Now, if I've got a Colab Pro, I can then access like an A100 or a V100 GPU in here as well. And you can actually, I think, purchase just credits to basically top yourself up to use the A100 for a few hours or something like that in there as well. So this runtime is key. We can also go through and just do things like run all. So you can see up here, if I select run all, it will actually go through and run everything in every cell here. I could also do things like run before. So if I went down to a certain cell and I decide, ah, I want to run everything before this, I can do that and I can run everything before. And you'll see it's gone through and run this now. And so now this has been run sixth and seventh. And, but we haven't run this cell, run everything up to this cell. Of course, I can do run after. So I can go down to a certain part and do that as well can also do a selection and run the selection. At any point, I can come down here and restart the session. So if I restart the session, it totally, let's close this down. It, it totally is refreshed everything. So now when I go through and I do shift enter here, you'll see that I'm now getting one and two being, this is the order that things are running. Now, one of the things that can be dangerous with the Google Colab is you can actually run these things out of order right? So you want to be careful that you tend to run things in order. So all the notebooks that I give you with the videos and stuff like that, they are basically built to be run in a specific order, meaning from the top to the bottom. So often with those, you can just come in here and go run all and just let it go through and run all of it. All right. So text, so this covers like uh, code cells, text cells. One of the other things you can do too, is you can put in latex in there. If you don't know what latex is, don't worry about it. It's just a way of showing math equations. You can see in here, we can take this, we can actually turn it into a nice math equation. We can move cells up or down. I talked about this briefly before. Here we can move this cell up or down. Now be very careful about that because if you're going to do run all and I'm accessing something before I've assigned it, I'm going to get an error. So we'll see here, I didn't assign B. 
So if I basically do command slash, I can get comments on or off. So that's the same as like VS code. And here I haven't assigned B. So what will I get? I'll get an error, right? Because B is not defined in here. So I'm just going to comment that and then run the cell again. And you can see that if we've just got an empty cell, it'll just run and nothing happens in here. If I come across here, I can actually see that I've got variables here. And you'll see that in here, we can see that, okay, we've got A set as a variable and the value to that is 25. So at, at any point, if we want to actually look at what our variables are set to or that kind of thing, if we've got something with a tensor shape, that can be really good that we can come in here and see it. If it's like NumPy, if it's PyTorch, if it's TensorFlow, etc., we can see the shape of these things in here. All right, some other nice things about this. If you want to basically use tab completion, we can do this. So here I'm just importing NumPy. So NumPy is a numerical library. And this is what I'm going to want at the end, but let's see. All right, so I'm going into NumPy here and I'm going to go to random and I'm going to press np.random and then you'll see that it's going to pop up with autocomplete in here. Now, what did I want? I wanted a random int. Okay, so I can basically just click on that or I could start typing it and it will then you know, give me some autocomplete in here. Another nice thing, just showing you on the next one, if I've got this rand int and I say, yep, I've got rand int and then I open the brackets for this, now I will actually see the documentation for this function. So this is numpy random for the namespace and then rand int. And then now I've got the documentation for, I can see that I need to set a low number and a high number or a low integer and a high integer. And then it will basically give me back a random number in there. So I can see everything that I want to set in there. So I'm just going to say, okay, we're going to start from zero to 10. So we get back zero to nine. And you can see now every time we run this, we're going to get a different random integer out. Okay. Two eights, a zero, two zeros, six, etc. All right. Another thing that you can do also is that if you want to get like the full docs and stuff for it, you can just put a question at the end of this, and then we can run this and you'll see that it will basically open up this help on the site so that you can get a full sort of a breakdown of, okay, this is what this takes in the full doc string for this. Now you can see I'm getting a warning here telling me that I'm connected to a GPU, but I'm not using a GPU. And it wants me to change back to a standard runtime. So really, if I'm not using a GPU, I shouldn't be selecting something that's using a GPU. Most of the time I'm going to have GPUs going. Anyway, so here you can see more sort of helpful docs and stuff for doing this. All right, let's look at some other things we can do. So we've got a cell and then below that, we've got like a standard out. So we can do things like plotting, right? So here you can see we're just bringing in NumPy, we're bringing in matplotlib, a plotting library for Python, going through this and just putting it together and we can basically plot something out in here. This can be really useful for lots of different things where you want to see things. And this will stay saved in our notebook. So, you know, we can see these outputs stay saved in our notebook. You may have noticed earlier on, one of the things I did was clear all the outputs so that we're seeing them for the first time as we go through. But if I save them, I can actually then share this notebook with someone and they can see all the outputs. That's what I do when I'm doing LLM demos or something like that in here. Next up, one of the things that we can do is basically uh, forms. There's a whole bunch of different things in here about like in different kinds of forms that we've got in here. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that we've just got sort of a nice user interface and stuff like that. But there's code underneath driving this and we can actually just click show code and we can see how this is being done. So the way forms are done in Colab is a little bit different than Jupyter Notebooks. Here, we've basically just got a thing where we're gonna basically say, right, we put in the title, it's gonna be string fields. I could change that to whatever. And you'll see that's gonna change the title. I can put in some text. And then I can say, okay, this is gonna be a parameter of type string. I can put in a choice for a drop down. So this is just basically passing in a list of strings. And this third one, I can basically do the same thing, but then I can make it so we can allow input equals true. So this means on this one, we can also then type, right? If we want to put something in there as well for this. And then we're just basically printing these out. Now we can hide the form. So we just see the code or we can come through and show the form 
and then hide the code. And that's what we had before. So if you're trying to make something for someone to play with it and stuff like that, this is how you can let them fill out different things and they don't need to see the code as, as we go through this. All right, in installing packages. You can use pip uh, quite easily through this. You can basically run through and install any sort of pip package that you want to. You can also install Linux packages. If you want to do an app get sort of install, you can do something like that. One of the big ones that Collab's used for a lot is TensorFlow and Keras. This obviously came out of Google. And you'll find that Collab actually has a lot of these libraries already pre-installed in there. You can go through it and run these. Now, Keras Core has actually changed now to be Keras 3. It has become Keras 3 already. This is an older version of the notebook that I used to use for this. System aliases. One of the things that you can do too is that if you want to run something like a Linux command, you can just put an exclamation mark or a bang in front of it. So if we do this, you can see where in this present working directory is content. Now, if we click over on the folders here, one of the key things that you'll see is that we've got this folders here. Now, this particular directory is called content. So if we click up on this, we can see that's where it is on the VM. And we can see we can actually go in and do other store things elsewhere on the VM. They have a whole section for Kaggle, that kind of thing in there as well. But most of the time you're going to be using this content directory. So one of the things that you can also do is that there are certain Linux commands that just work without the exclamation mark. So PWD is one of those things. Both PWD and LS will actually give you similar things. So we can basically use LS as a Linux command with this, but it's also got an alias assigned to it to just do LS and stuff like that. We can see what's going on in here. One of the things that you're going to want to do often is check that you've got a GPU. Now, I know that we've got a GPU for this because I can see I've got T4 up here. But just to check, I can basically do NVIDIA SMI. And you'll see that will bring up all the details about my GPU that I've got in here. Remember, I'm using the free version of Colab here. So this is one of the cool things about this is you can actually get this kind of thing. This you know, is not a, a assigned one. So if you don't put the exclamation mark here, you would get an error like this because just it's not assigned in here. But it is in Linux in there. So you can try this out and have a play with this. All right, another thing that's going to be really important is using your Google Drive with Colab. So I mentioned earlier that if you wanted to make a copy of this notebook and save it, you could just come down to save a copy in Drive, right? This is something that you can... Do. You can also save a copy in GitHub by connecting your GitHub. You can save a copy as a GitHub gist as well. In One of the other things that you'll want to do sometimes too is that when you save a copy, it's got access to your Google Drive just to save the notebook. We can't actually save files to our Google Drive unless we actually hook this up. So if we want to actually mount our Google Drive in the Colab, we have to go through this sort of authentication dance in here. What you'll see is I'm going to run this cell and I'm going to get a pop-up coming up. So this is basically saying, okay, do you want to permit this notebook to access your Google Drive files? So then you're basically mounting your Google Drive in here. Without doing this, you can't save outputs, whether they're text outputs, image outputs, and stuff like that to your Google Drive. So in this case, I'm going to go through what I call the authentication dance. So you'll see that you'll get a pop-up, something like this. Uh, I will then basically click on my account. And then here, I'll be able to basically go through and click continue. It will then give me a final one where I can basically click continue again. And you'll see that now my Google Drive is actually mounted in here for this. And you can see that what I'm actually doing is, it takes a little bit while to do. It's basically mounting the Google Drive in the folder content as G Drive. So you'll see that once I've got this going, I can actually then run LS and I can see that now I've got G Drive and I've got uh, sample data in there. And you can see now that if I come in here and I go into my Google Drive and I basically, I've got a folder in there called Colab Projects RL for reinforcement learning. If I run that, I can see, sure enough, I've got a bunch of different folders of things that I've saved in there for different Atari games and playing RL with Atari games, etc. All right, so next up, we've got what are called magics. And a magic basically lets you do a certain thing. So here you can see I've got the magic where it's basically just running some HTML in a cell. 
so here we've just got a, a simple marquee, which is basically running some text, running it across as we go through this. And if we come in and look at this, there's a whole bunch of different magics in here. So the ones that you'll see me use a lot are things like time and timing it for timing how long cells go. Our file is one that I use often for doing these. There's a whole bunch of different things in here that you can do for showing things like SVGs, for running things in Bash, for doing a whole bunch of these different things. One of the ones that used to be used quite a bit was the TensorFlow version that used to have to specify if you had TensorFlow 1 or TensorFlow 2. I think this has gone away. So it's, okay, I still see it there, but it's not something you really need to do now, although it may come back with some new versions of Keras and stuff coming out. Finally, if you want to basically time your code to know like roughly how long things are doing it, you can basically time it for a function or for just a line in here, or you can time a cell. And you'll see that what these things do is that this one actually runs the function multiple times and then works out, you know, that, okay, this is the average of how long it took to run. And the cell one basically gives us the CPU time and the wall time for the entire cell that we've got in there. All right. Lastly, one of the key things is if you've got errors in here, how do you start again? One of the biggest thing, easiest ways to do this is disconnect and delete runtime. If I do this, I will lose the entire runtime and then I will have to basically run everything again from scratch with a new VM. So the good thing there is that you're actually getting a whole new VM for this uh, as you go through. In the past, one of the tricks that we used to do is this sort of kill the Linux machine of kill 9.1. Generally not needed nowadays, but I'll leave it in there if you, in case you want to do it. All right, some things over on the side here. So you have a table of contents that you can basically go through and select the different things and it will go to those things that, you know, as we go through it. We've also got, we've covered the variables one, but we can do search and replace, you know, we'll find and replace in here. One of the key ones is this idea of keys. So the idea of secrets is a new thing to collab. So what this basically is that if I make a, let's come down to the bottom here. So if I made a secret, let's say I wanted to have my Gemini key, right? So I've got my Gemini, or actually I think it's called AI Studio, something like that. And let's say it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in there. Now I can either, I can do it and see it like that. Now here I can turn it on or off. Now, when I turn it on or off, I'm just saying that this notebook has access to it or not. So th this particular notebook has access to it. What I can also do though, is I can come over here and inject this into the code. So you can see here, now if I copy this AI Studio bit and put this in here, I can actually assign this. Now, what I normally would do is I would import OS here, and then I would have something like OS dot environment, and then I would open this up and I would set this as an environmental variable. Okay. So now you'll see that when I run this cell, it's going to pop up and say, Hey, this notebook, it wants to use your AI studio key. Are you okay with that? Now you should do this. This is the way of protecting your open AI keys, your various API keys, etc., and stuff like that. Then you can now just grant access. Now, when I share this notebook with anyone, they won't have access to my key because my key is kept in my environment, but they will be able to set their own key in there and then use my code just as simply going through this. So you'll see that now we've got that. If we come here and just put that in the next line, we can see that sure enough, our key that we set in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, is actually now what's loaded into the OS environment in there with this name. So if you wanted to use this for your open AI key, this is something that you can do quite easily as you go through here. So I think this covers the basics of how to get started with Colab and how to use it. I like sharing my notebooks in Colab because people can just take it and run it straight away without having to set up a huge environment or download lots of packages and stuff like that. Most of the packages, even things like Hugging Face Transformers now is actually installed into Google Colab already. It's very easy to install any packages. I tend to install my packages right at the top so people can see what packages are being installed. You can see what's being run and you can see the 
outputs that I got and you can see whether you, you're getting the same outputs or not. Anyway, as always, if you found the video useful, please click like and subscribe. Put any comments, any questions that you have in the comments below, and I will talk to you in the next video.